Hello, everyone, and welcome to the workshop on teaching strategies for engaging students, Rethinking Long Lectures. My name is Dr. Yvonne Johnson, and I work in the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning at NIU. I help faculty instructors and graduate assistants with pedagogy, andragogy, and integration of multimedia, as well as conducting other teaching and technology supports. Today, we're going to be talking about lectures and what's happening in lectures, why it's happening, revamping the lectures, and techniques that you can use to increase attention and engagement. First, let's consider what's happening in lectures. When you think about your lectures, are there any obstacles that come to mind, such as distractions or a multitude of different things that people can be thinking about, various obligations, the variety of information and the flood of information that we all experience every day? Are there stressors that can be impacting their the attention of students, maybe your attention as an instructor, and other types of, of demands that might be pulling on students' time and attention. When you think about why these potential obstacles are occurring, let's consider that for a moment. Don't take it personally. Lapses in everyone's attention occur throughout the day, and it's, it's just part of the way that each one of us functions. And one of the things that research shows us is that students are more attentive in the lecture and the techniques when a variety of different approaches are used and when they're engaged. And if we think about ourselves as faculty instructors, we are also more attentive and engaged when we have varied approaches and interactions in our lectures and our discussions. And we're going to be looking at some ways that you can revamp the lecture to make it more engaging and to keep the students' attention and involvement throughout the lecture. One of the important foundational aspects is starting with organizing a lecture. And it's just like when we write a proposal, we prepare a scholarly publication, we prepare for a project of any type, um, make an artistic creation, get involved in some type of a project, we organize and we prepare for that. And we want to do that with our lectures as well. You want to have the purpose of the lecture. So think about that when you are organizing your lecture. What's the focus? The focus. What's the purpose? And use that kind of as your guiding light when you are organizing and de designing, developing, creating this lecture. When you're presenting that, you'll elaborate on the topic, use and write the outline as you would for a, a publication. Some of those tips that we learned when um, many years ago when we were first learning how to prepare a, a communication um, approach or some type of paper or social media type of approach. We need to think about how we're going to elaborate on the topic, connect it back with the purpose, bring in your learning and teaching objectives, and have those all serve as your focus and purpose for this lecture. And use multimedia resources. We have students who connect with different types of deliveries and to keep students attention if we vary those different types of deliveries and use multimedia resources then students will be more attentive their interest 
is peaked and they don't get bored and lose attention. One of the things to think about when you're organizing your lecture is the types of interactions that you're going to have, the faculty students interactions. How are, how are you going to engage with the students? How are the students going to engage with the content? And then how are the students going to engage with each other? And integrate those when you're organizing your lecture. And you can put in some simple formative assessments to maybe some quick chats, some polling, and then bring it all together. If you use the simple structure for organizing your lecture, it will help you to be deliberate and to intentionally develop approaches that are aligned with the purpose of the lecture. The presentation focuses on the purpose and the learning objectives, your teaching objectives as well. Make sure you have that engagement. Then have a formative assessment you're getting some feedback from the students and then wrap it all up nicely by tying your summary to the purpose of the lecture and the learning objectives. And that will make sense to students. And when they understand how everything is connected, then it supports their learning. They're not confused trying to figure out, well, why did Dr. Johnson talk about this topic when I thought we were supposed to be talking about this other topic? So that's a good approach that you can use to start a sound foundation and organize your lecture. And when you're developing the lecture, deliberately think about techniques that you can integrate to increase attention and engagement. And we're going to cover uh, several of these today. Think about ones that would make sense for the courses that you teach, the students that you have. Different students have different preferences and skills, and different courses lend themselves to different approaches. So this is sort of a buffet of different approaches that you can use. And you might consider trying um, Starting simple, trying one of these and refining it, and then trying another one. Um, so one approach that you can have is have student have a student-led lecture. Maybe ask them to present on a specific topic, and they could be short, short lectures on specific topics. Um, when I was in one of my programs, I had an instructor who assigned each one of us a student-led lecture. We were supposed to cover a certain concept. And it's, as we all know, when we teach, we learn content very well. So that's an approach that you might, might consider. I would say select a, a very focused topic and have a short, ask them to do a short presentation, give them a couple of objectives that you want them to address, whether that's they need to address the key components of, of carbon, give an overview, connect it to a certain contemporary topic, something, but give them a couple of objectives that they're supposed to be addressing. And then they have the topic, they have a couple of objectives, Give them a short time frame, maybe seven minutes, let's say. We know that as lectures get longer, people lose attention. So give them that criteria, and um, that might be something for you to consider. Another approach, flipped classroom. They do a lot of classroom activities where the lecture part is often recorded and the students review that, then in the classroom, you apply those components from the lecture, those key ideas in activities. And we know that research shows when students are engaged and actively learning and collaborating, that the content and the 
information moves from their short term memory to their long term memory because they're really working with with that content. And so flipped classroom requires that they address some of the content ahead of time and then you apply it with the engaging activities during the class. You might have mystery guests. We know that novelty piques people's interest, kind of like a cliffhanger. Maybe you have authors, professional experts. We all know people that are leaders in the field. Maybe you set up some short sessions with some of these people to and have a mystery guest so it kind of piques their interest and they say oh wow you know we had a, a session with this particular author we had a session with this famous researcher who's done so much work in artificial intelligence or something and so a little bit of novelty piques their interest and we also know that when emotions are a part of the learning experience that students remember things more. And we know from ourselves that if something was an emotional um, situation, that we're going to remember it more. And so if you create a little novelty and excitement, then they're more likely to remember it and to be excited about the speaker or that activity for the day. Micro lectures are important. What we found through research is that rather than hosting a an extended lecture, it's better to chunk it up on certain topics and create a series of of mini lectures. And that also that helps students to focus on a certain concept learn that you can really focus on that in the short maybe five minute lecture as opposed to having a 60 minute lecture where you address many many topics and then they may feel a bit overwhelmed after they've addressed all of these different topics you've addressed all these different topics in the longer lecture Micro lectures are also easier for you to update when you have a series of them focused on specific topics and something new comes into the, the field about that, then you go back and you can more readily address and revise that micro lecture than if you had to redo the entire 60 minute or however long longer lecture. And when you're thinking about micro lectures, Again, we go back to focusing on the learning objective. Some tips are be deliberate when you're speaking to the students. Say this lesson will focus on X, Y, Z. There's these key phrases that can help them to get their mind in the framework of, okay, we're going to focus on this aspect of learning about carbon today. So I really need to, this micro lecture is about that specific topic. Or this is an important issue because these types of statements help students to know, okay, this is important. I really need to make sure that I understand that. And then you're summarizing. We have addressed XYZ concepts. Now let's move on to the next topic. And when you summarize, you're just like we talked about when you're preparing a lecture, when you're preparing a, a publication a presentation, you tell them what you're going to tell them, you tell them, and then you wrap it up and say, this is what we talked about. So you bring the topic full circle and connect back to those learning objectives. And if there's something that's really, really key, you know, let me reiterate. And you could say how this lecture is going to connect with the subsequent lectures, how it builds a foundation, how it's going to connect with activities that they do in class. So the students see how this all fits together. And it's really important for their learning. If we can deliberately plan and let them know our plan and how all of these components of 
the content and our lectures and our class activities fit together, then they can relax and say, okay, I understand this and get focused on, on learning. And some tips for lectures, provide a lecture outline. Students like this for taking notes. It gives them an idea of where you're going and helps them to, to focus on the plan for the day for the lecture. Use micro lectures and video. That's one of those multimedia. We're using additional types of approaches for content and delivery that keeps them attentive. And if they're short micro lectures and they're more likely to watch the, the full lecture, they can absorb that content. You can post shared notes. You can plan breaks. That's important. If, if you don't plan in breaks, then people will start taking breaks anyway, depending upon the different um, length of your longer classroom time, then um, think about if it's appropriate to have the breaks. But like I said, if you don't plan them in and it's a long class, class time, they're going to take them anyway. And build in those student reactions and think back to those interactions we talked about with the faculty student interaction, the content, student content interaction, and student student. And when you're planning your lecture, if you have thought this through carefully, it'll make sense and you'll continue to help build that deeper level of knowledge through the practices that you've used for that lecture. And active learning is very important in keeping students engaged, excited, and supporting their learning. They're dealing with the content, connecting to it, finding out what, what did they know about this already, what are they going to learn, how are they going to use it, and they're interacting with each other. And the research overwhelmingly shows how important that is to support their learning and um, engagement. There are some preconditions that you need to think about in terms of active student learning. Prepare them. And that's why I'll always give some sort of a simple template outline of what we're going to be talking about today or outline for the particular activity that they're going to engage in. And when the students have that outline, they are, they can focus. They're not going to be spending their cognitive bandwidth on trying to figure out what they're supposed to be doing. And then motivation, what is their motivation? Why is it important for them to learn this? And you can ask students to think about the topic and, and why it's important. You can ask them to bring in contemporary type of examples. You can also connect it with their future courses, with their careers, why this is important. And the absence of fear is also important because if they're going to be engaging with each other, they need to feel that they are in a, a safe space and that they need to understand that the learning process involves addressing things that they don't know. So for them to say, okay, I don't understand this, or I don't know this, or I'm, I need to ask questions, they need to feel that the learning space is safe. They need to feel that they're not afraid. And that, that goes to building that sense of community and connections, which starts from the first time you have contact with the students. And if you have those, you know, prepared some kind of a, a template, they have the information they need to be successful, understand, you know, what's the value of this, and feel that they are in a safe space and they're not afraid, then 
they're ready to engage in active learning. And the first five minutes of a class session is really important. And I always have some sort of a, an activity right away when the class session starts to engage the students, redirect their attention from whatever they were doing before to the, to the class that we are having at that time, to the content that we're having. And if you do that intentionally in the beginning of the class, then you're going to be transitioning them from their prior activities to being engaged and attentive in the class. And there's different approaches that you can use to do that. One of the, um, the KWL approach is um, a sample of that is, what did you, what do you think you know about artificial intelligence? This, this is we're using artificial intelligence as a potential example topic. So what do they think they know? What do they want to know? And what did they learn? That's one approach that you can use to engaging the students right away when the, the session starts. Focused writing might be appropriate for um, a course, depending upon what your topic is, what your discipline is. What is a piece of information that, that they learned that they didn't expect to learn? What is a piece of information that's essential about the topic? And what can they say in one sentence to share their understanding? And this can be done in um, class type discussions as well. I often do this as a, an introductory, everyone shares out just briefly answers to maybe one of these, one of these questions. And I do that with my freshman students in UNIV 101 to get them comfortable talking in class, get them connecting with each other. They see that other students have the same types of questions and, and um, are learning and discovering at the same rates. It helps them to feel more like they're part of a community. You can also do this with the focused writing as well. And retrieval practice, we know that retrieval is really important in terms of being able to go back after a period of time and access that information. And you can deliberately bring this practice into your course, have some, you know, just general discussion about the topic, and then go to the two things that they learned in a prior course, in a summer course. So you're showing them that there is a connection between your course, the course that they're in now, and prior courses. And, and then how is this going to be, how is this going to be used? Um, they can do a brain dump of, you know, what, what were the things that they learned? They can all share this. And then they're seeing that these courses are not independent. They all fit into the larger picture of, of their learning and of their, their coursework and of their life because these things that they're learning in the courses are valuable far beyond their um, college courses as well. And then web conferencing, we've all become very accustomed to web conferencing. You can use the polling and different ways to have them engage. And we have separate sessions on, on web conferencing, but just simple activities like the whiteboard, and you can have them just quickly jot down something. And it, it's kind of a novel thing, but it's also a formative assessment type of approach. It's a way to see where they are in terms of understanding of the content. You can poll them to see maybe there are some, some common questions that students have. And um, you can also have them share their screens. And when you're having the students share, that shows them that they're 
their perspective is is valued. And when you take that perspective and use it to adapt and integrate it with the course, then they're more likely to be engaged and active because they see that their voice matters in the course. And web conferencing can go a long way in, in doing that when you intentionally use it as part of your organizing the lecture and bringing in those different approaches that we talked about. You can use interactive quizzes. We have Kaltura, the system, and to keep them engaged on a certain topic, you might create a video um, and then integrate some quiz questions, and that's more interactive. And when you have video, it's you're again bringing in that multimedia, and it's a way to conduct those assessments in, a, in another way so that the course is not boring, that you're using different types of, of approaches. And map it out. You can have students create concept maps of the topics that you're talking about. And I had students do this a couple of weeks ago. In my course, we were talking about different aspects of techniques they can use to be successful in college. And we had a few different, maybe three different main concepts. And then they mapped out these different concepts and how they could individually take advantage of NIU resources to support their success in college. It's always interesting to see a concept map because if, if you ask students to map out a particular topic, maybe the, the concept that you're talking about is a hierarchical type of a concept. And you ask students to map, just draw a simple picture of their understanding of how some of these different components of the, the topic relate to each other. And let's say that they draw a spider type of concept map when there really is a hierarchical type of relationship between these different components of the concept or the topic you're talking about. Then that gives you a good idea, okay, they're, they're not understanding that this part of the the topic is really higher up on the scale and these other components are a couple of levels down. Or maybe they draw a flow chart and that shows steps when really it's more of a spider type of outline. So concept maps can be very enlightening to you and to the students and you can use them as sort of a formative type of assessment. You can also ask them the muddiest points, a formative type of assessment that gets at what was unclear to them, what do they want to know more about, and you could do this uh, quick polling, you could do a quick Qualtrics type of a survey, you could do whiteboard activities, you could have something that they submit at the end of class. And then you can take action on that because so if there's a trend in your course that a number of students were unclear about a similar topic, you get this information from a muddiest point type of activity. And then the next class session, or maybe you put some additional resources in Blackboard, you can address that. Or if they're all excited about a certain or many of them are excited about certain current events or something that's going on on campus that relates to your discipline, then you can bring more of that in. And then you're showing them that you've considered their perspectives, they're valued, that you are taking it into account, addressing them in the class sessions and in Blackboard, and bringing their voice to the table as a collaborator in this teaching and learning process. 
You can also ask tough questions, just how, what, when, why about the certain complex topic that you all are talking about, and then just drill down to continue asking them to expand on their perspective. Maybe you ask additional students to expand upon that, and then you're bringing in a number of different people in the class to construct this knowledge as a community. And when the students see that, you know, you're addressing these complex, tough questions, you are getting them to help each other to share their perspectives and build upon each other's knowledge that they really get excited about that and they're more likely to be engaged in, and active in that process. And think about what makes sense for you. We've talked about a number of different approaches that you might take. And what I would recommend is think about these approaches, select one that seems like it makes sense for you, try it out, you might ask your students, what did you think about this? Did it support your learning? Did it work for you as the instructor? And, you know, refine it if it seems like it's going to be a viable option for you. Then try another one. I would not recommend just trying a whole bunch of approaches. Um, I definitely am a proponent of, of trying something, refining it, then adding something else, refining it. You need to think deliberately about why does this make sense? Don't just try some sort of approach because you wanna try a different approach. Really think about it from the pedagogical, andragogical approach. Why does this make sense for you to use multimedia in this process? Or why does it make sense for you to have student-led lecture for this, et cetera, as, as relates to each one of these techniques. And in closing, the we talked about the lecture, what's happening and why, and how to revamp it. That organizational piece is really key. And then various techniques that you can use. I would encourage you to um, try try one of them out. And um, you know, let me know if you have questions. I'm happy to help. As always, our team at CIDL is here to support you, and I wish you all the best for the semester and for, for your day.